Okay, you're going to take your two long balloons and make a knot in the closed ends um, about a centimeter away from the end. And then you're going to take an elastic or a rubber band, give it a snip, and this is just a size reference so you know um, how big that should be. And then give it another another rubber band to slip, uh, snip, and then take those two ends and line them up over your uterus and tie a knot incorporating those two bands which will make that'll be your cervix and the two bands will be your uterine vessels okay then you're going to take six rubber bands so three on each side and give those all a little cut to create three strands on each side and then take your three ends together and adding that uterine vessel one tie a knot cool and then you will do the exact same thing on the other side. So that knot is going to represent your ovary. And we need to affix that ovary to the uterine horn, so you're just going to tie your uterine horn around that knot and that will be the connection point. So you should have three strands kind of dangling and then one connected to the uterus itself. So four things coming off your ovary. Next you're going to take your glove and then um, tie a knot in each finger at the base so that we'll make our bladder out of this. Takes a little bit of time, but we will get there. Okay, there's our glove, and then we're going to flip it inside out. And that's our bladder. Then take your three uh, gauze squares or sponges and put them inside the bladder. Then you'll want to prepare your ure ureters. So give a couple rubber bands a snip and you've got a ureter for each side. Then um, you may need to stretch out your glove depending on which type of glove you have. They're all old so um, past their expiry and tie a loose knot here um, so don't tighten it and then you can use a pair of needle drivers or you can use some hemostats if you have some to grasp the two ends of the ureters, pull them through that loose knot and then you can then tighten down the knot. And there we've got our bladder set up ready. Uh, the next thing you're going to do is to attach the IV tubing, don't mind my hair. Um, to the back of the basket and this is this is just to keep it kind of down and um, secured to your table so that when you're spaying it it doesn't move um, and so then you can take some pieces of tape you can use any tape to do this so 
just any tape to secure that IV tubing down. Later we're going to put some binder clips, or sorry, um, suction cups to secure it to the table. But for now, this is when you want to put your uterus and ovaries into your tray. Sorry about that hair. And um, t here I've just tied a knot. Um, to secure it to the tray, you could also use tape, which I think I'm going to do a little later on. But if you've got little leggies on your uterus, then go ahead and tie a knot um, or use tape. Okay, and then the first thing, just pick a strand, any strand, and that will represent your suspensory ligament and insert those into the kind of top lateral or corner aspect of the basket. And you want these to be fairly taut. Um, and then flip your basket over and then you can start, uh, secure that with some tape. And there you've got your suspensory ligaments ready to rock. The next thing you want to do is um, your ovarian vessels, so part of your pedicle. You want those to come out kind of the side of the basket, directly adjacent to the ovary on that side. So as you can see, just let them come out the side. And then these ones you want to be a little bit loose. So I just kind of pull up on my ovaries just to the level of the basket um, and then flip that over and that's just showing that they're kind of loosey-goosey and then we're going to secure that with some tape loose, loose ovarian vessels. And the last thing that we need to secure would be the round ligaments. So those travel in the broad ligament and they will kind of insert somewhere around the uterine body. So to simulate that, we're just gonna put them through the more caudal aspect of the basket. These ones you want to be a little bit taut, same kind of tautness as your suspensory ligament. So um, any ligament usually, you know, is holding things. So they're usually a little bit taut. All right, that's good. Now we need to insert our bladder. Remember the ureters are dorsal. So when you insert your bladder just kind of over the uterus, you might have to go like slightly to the side. Um, then make sure to turn them so that the ureters are dorsal and then just secure that with some tape. I just reused some of my uterus tape and then added an extra one just making sure it's nice and solid in there. And sorry about the hair again. Um, then you need to install the ureters so they're kind of, they lie you know, pretty dorsal. Um, and you just need to put them kind of at the a third of the way up the basket. And they don't have to be super taut, so they can be a little bit loose. And secure them with tape. Okie dokie, that's our kind of setup for all the organs. Now we need to add our omentum. So these are some gloves that you will put the wrist end towards the kind of cranial aspect and the finger end more caudally. And then you can just squeeze them through one of the holes in the basket 
and lay them over your organs so that they get in your way because that's what the omentum will do. You can secure those with tape. Although you shouldn't really be pulling on them when you're doing the the spay. You're not pulling caudally at least. But the tape keeps them there. And now we've got our cloth covering the whole setup. So this is like your body wall. So you can just hold that in place with some binder clips. And it should be fairly taut, like you don't want wrinkles in there. So just make it nice and taut and then I'm turning this tray so that the cranial aspect is towards my non-dominant hand because that's what would be happening in real life. Now we're attaching the binder clips to the suction, or sorry, the ivy tubing to the suction cups and this is so that we can stick our basket to the table that we're working on. Alternatively, you could just hold this in your lap, um, but it just kind of gives you just something to pull against. And if you want to, this is not always necessary, but if you want, you can insert um, like a safety pin just lateral to where the suction cup is clipped onto the IV tubing and that just prevents it from slipping out. But to be honest, the IV tubing size is pretty appropriate for the suction cup, so you may not need to do this step. And don't hurt yourself if you're doing this step. Okay, and then you just squeeze the suction cups down um, I'm doing this on a metal table, so that might work better than most surfaces. If you have metal in your home, you can do that. Otherwise, a bit of water under the suction cups works. All right, so when you're ready to spay your model, grab your thumb forceps. Remember to hold them in the correct way, which is this way. And um, you just need a pair of scissors, tent up the fabric and make a little snip big enough that you can get a blade of your scissor in and then you can cut cranially and caudally. Here my scissors are not super sharp um, so I changed my hand position to the backhand technique and that seemed to work a lot better. And make sure you use the wrong the thumb and ring finger grip when you're using your scissors, so fourth finger. Alright, so you've made a, a hole in the middle third of your tray. Um, now you can insert your fingers in there and kind of, I like to push my abdominal contents cranially just to kind of get them out of the way of the reproductive tract. And then you can use your spay or crochet hook and lift up the body wall with your thumb forceps and you can bring the abdominal contents out to the incision and if you've got something that's not the uterus then you put it back and if you got the uterus then you're golden. This is just a close-up of snagging the uterus, what it would look like and then you grasp that with your fingers and then you walk your fingers up and you find the ovary and I like to flip the ovary up kind of like that and now you need to find your suspensory ligament and it's the one that's going the most cranial so you can follow that with your fingers if it doesn't break with your fingers give it a little snip with the scissors just part way through the elastic band and then break it with your fingers and that's very similar to what it will be and where you position your fingers in real life. So the next rubber band going down that should be kind of loose is the ovarian vessels and so you can use a hemostat or a chip clip to clamp across there and then you need to apply two ligatures. So because this is the most like a cat spay 
Um, two circumferential ligatures will be sufficient. If you're doing a dog spay, you probably want to, you may want to beef up your ligation, but for a cat spay, two circumferential ligatures is usually sufficient. And remember to throw at least four throws, creating a two knot, creating two knots, sorry. Um, and then cutting your suture ends, remember to leave at least three millimeters, um, although I usually like to leave more than three millimeters. This is just showing moving your hemostat up, so more kind of distally towards your ovary and then placing the ligature in the crush bed of the where the hemostat was previously located. Notice how I have flipped my hemostat. I've rotated it so I've inserted it with the or like clamped across my vessels with the tips up and then I've rotated it so the tips are down. And that allows me to see exactly where I'm placing my ligature and what I'm ligating while doing surgery alone. So if you have an assistant, your assistant can provide visualization, but if you're doing surgery alone, this is a really nice technique. Okay, so now we're ready to transect and we've got to make sure that we don't lose what we have. So we're already clamped across that with a hemostat so we can go ahead and transect. And this is just showing where you would apply your hemostats to prevent back bleeding. And then this is showing how you would grasp with your thumb forceps. Make sure your ligatures are secure. Don't grasp proximal to your ligatures, always distal. And then releasing. And because it's an elastic, of course it will recoil a lot, but in real life, it will recoil a little bit um, if there's tension on it. Okay, and we can remove these because we only have one pair of needle drivers, so just to show where to do that. And we're going to follow our uterine horn down to the body and across to the other side and scoop that up with our fingers and then follow our uterine horn all the way up to the second ovary. Um, so this is the right ovary and finding that suspensory ligament, we've palpated it, we know that it, that's what it is. Try to break it, not successful, give it a snip with some scissors and then apply your fingers very close together so that you only apply force on the structure that you want to break and not the other delicate tissues. And then the next thing that we want to do is to find our ovarian vessels so they will be more kind of lateral and in line with the ovary and a little bit looser than the suspensory ligament. So we'll use a hemostat and clamp across our vessel. And this is showing applying ligatures on the other side. So I'm using that technique where I like to flip my hemostat, but it's still like it's not staying where I want it. So I like to use a thick pair of scissors, like mayo scissors, and I put them in the finger holes, and that usually holds my hemostat rotated like that so that I can see exactly what I'm doing. So in junior surgery you will obviously have an assistant to do that kind of stuff for you but when you're out in practice and doing the surgery alone um, this is a nice technique to use. Alternatively if you've got a pair of caramels um, that will span across the incision. You can use that to help hold the ovary outside of the body, but my hemostat here is too small and it wants to slip inside. So I'm again going to use my scissors and 
put them in the ring or the finger holes so that it holds that nice and out of the abdomen for me so I can see what I'm doing making sure not to ligate structures that are not in the pedicle so it's very common to inadvertently like or um, include some of the fat from the subcutis or even from the omentum into your ligature and that will make it less secure so making sure that you only have the pedicle in your ligature that is ideal okay and here I'm going to show a different way of tagging and transecting so this is just repositioning my hemostat and then I'm going to tag with my thumb forceps and then um, cut in between the ovary and my thumb forceps so this method I think I don't personally like it I think it's a little clunky I like to use a hemostat but um, a lot of people do that technique either with scissors or with a scalpel you can cut. All right, now I'm gonna follow my uterus down and just kind of splay out the broad ligament and you'll be able to see the uterine vessels coursing just beside the uterine horns in the broad ligament. The round ligament will be more taut and that's the one you want to break down with your fingers and if you can you can just rip the the rubber band I my fingers aren't strong enough to do that all the time so I give it a little snip and then I break it and then do the same on the other side so the taut one is what we want to break the loosey-goosey one in real life I mean you'll see that there's blood in it so you'll know not to break it but um, in for this model it will be the the taut one that you're going to want to snip and then break with your fingers. Okay, and so we're going to try to we kind of reflect the uterus caudally if we can, but here I don't really have enough room to see everything, so I'm just going to extend my incision Caudally, and this is something that you absolutely can do and should do in real life if you can't really exteriorize everything. So we're going to extend that incision and then reflect the uterus caudally. And then I'm just going to kind of show you close up what that looks like. Now we're going to apply our two ligatures and here I'm using a strangle knot. So going under making an X on my finger, holding it with my thumb, and then doing the same thing, making another X, holding it with my thumb, going under the two loops, grasping the end, and checking it, making sure that looks correct, and moving it to where I want it to go, and then strangulating that tissue down, and applying nice good pressure to crush all those tissues and any sort of vasculature that's in there. I really like the strangle knot for any uterus. Um, it's just a nice beefy knot that makes you feel really secure in your ligature. And I usually don't like to apply a hemostat until after I've done my ligations or apply it far enough away that it doesn't get in the way of my ligations. Here I'm doing a transfixation ligature, and there's many ways to do this. The one I like to do is to put a surgeon's throw on one side. You could also put a knot, so you could do a second throw. But doing a surgeon's throw is totally acceptable, and then um, wrapping everything around and then doing a normal four throw square knot on the other side making sure to really get all that tissue nice and strangulated down the uterus can be very friable you don't know until you 
try to ligate it, so that's why it's recommended to try to avoid using hemostats at least until after your ligatures are placed, because sometimes you can just saw right through the tissue with your hemostat. Alright, so now I'm doing the technique that I like, so I apply the hemostat to my structure and then cut distal to it. Usually I do this with a scalpel, but scissors will work in this context. And so my hemostat is keeping that out so that I can then grasp it with my thumb forceps and make sure to grasp it distal to your ligatures and have a nice good hold of it but trying not to grasp a vessel and if you do grasp a vessel it's okay you can reposition your thumb forceps and this is just showing that you want to observe it before you let it go even after you've observed it out of the abdomen you want to observe it in the abdomen too so i usually use my fingers to retrieve my pedicles and this is what it looks like on the spay model you want to find them on both sides. The side closest to you will be the harder one to find, but you can do it. And then the bladder, so to find the uterine stump, you, it's going to live under the bladder, and you can retrofre, retroflex the bladder out of your abdomen if that helps. Sometimes it's easier just to push it aside and then um, grasp the structure underneath it between that and the colon and everything looks great so now you can suture and you're done this is a kind of fast mo version of how to do this with a chip clip um, so finding the spinsery giving it a snip and finding the ovarian vessels applying your chip clip and then ligating same deal proximal to your hemostats or chip clip. This is um, cat gut suture. I was just trying to use up old suture. It is not as pleasant to work with. There's one, like, one ligature down. And you can place your ligatures exactly where you want them. You don't have to leave them exactly, you know, where you form them. You could preform them, leave them loose, move them, and then crush the tissues. Okay, and then you can regrasp. Looks good. Following that to the next side, there's my suspensory. Oh, I could snap that one just with my fingers. There's my ovarian vessels. Use the length of the chip clip to help you help span the length of the um, the width of the incision so that it holds things outside of the abdomen for you. It's like a little assistant. And then you can reposition your chip clip so that you can practice getting things in the crush bed. You don't really need to do that with a cat, but with a dog, you probably want to do that. All right, looking spiffy. We'll get that out of there, and that's how you prevent back bleeding from the uterine vessels that kind of anastomose with the ovarian vessels. And then breaking the round ligaments. Okay, ready to ligate the uterus. Here I'm going to show applying the chip clip to the uterus before putting my ligatures. And it doesn't mean you can't do this, it's just you have to make sure your ligatures are far enough away from your hemostat that it's not fanning the tissue out so that you can't get a good waste. So you want to make sure you're proximal enough that you can do it and if you're not what you can do is you can flash your hemostat so that means temporarily releasing the pressure getting that waste and then reapplying it all right we're good to go 
Now we just need to transect and re-grasp with our thumb and forceps, making sure it's not bleeding. Awesome.